chapter number 8, verse number 1. I'm going to begin here in the very uh, first part of the chapter. Verse number 1, the Bible says this. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now all throughout the book of Hebrews, we see the Lord Jesus Christ being spoken of as our priest. And specifically being spoken of as our high priest. We know from reading the Bible that there is only one mediator between God and men. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 5 tells us that. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the only man, the only person that has ever been a true mediator and will ever be a true mediator. Amen. There has never been anyone that can fill that gap ever besides the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I said that uh, to say this. I'm going to be preaching uh, this evening on the subject of the symbolism of the priesthood. The symbolism of the priesthood. I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 1. Now just because we see the Lord Jesus Christ as you know, the one and only true high priest, does that negate the fact that there were priests of the Old Testament? No, there, it doesn't, does it? And, and I'll give you a perfect example of this symbolism. We see this with the sacrifices of the Old Testament as well. Who is the one and only real true sacrifice? What is the one and only real sacrifice? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But we also see it all throughout the Old Testament. They're bringing all of these sacrifices, right? What was the, what was the, the degree of efficacy of the sacrifices of the Old Testament? What was it? Zero, wasn't it? What was the efficacy? It was, it was not effective at all, was it? At all. It, it made, the Bible says in, in Hebrews, I believe, chapter number 10, that it's not possible by the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sin. The sacrifices of the Old Testament did nothing for sin at all, period. The only purpose that they served, the sole purpose, was the symbolism that pointed forward to Christ. That's it, only. The priests of the Old Testament were not a true mediator. A lot of people may not have thought about this before, but as far as being a mediator between God and men, they couldn't fill that gap. No man, no normal man can fill that gap. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. So you may or may not have thought about this before, but and we're not going to look at this particularly, but the book of Hebrews actually explains that if those priests were good enough, in the same way if those sacrifices were good enough and they could fill that gap, then we had no need for a new priest. Then we had no need for a new sacrifice. The priests of the Old Testament weren't true mediators. They were only a picture, or they were only symbolic of the true mediator to come. Now, here in the book of Hebrews, it talks about, over and over again, it talks about Jesus Christ as our high priest. I want to look at one more passage of that, and then I'm going to get into the symbolism of the priesthood of the Old Testament. Look at Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 1. It says this, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, and it says this, and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And I'm sure this is something that everyone here is very familiar with, but the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is our high priest. He is our mediator between God and man. Now, in the Old Testament, there, there was a priesthood that was instituted, wasn't there? There was a priesthood that God appointed, and what was the purpose of them? We know, as I just mentioned, of course, that it was a figure or a shadow of things to come. Everything from the Old Testament that was eliminated was only there to be a picture. So that's a good way to understand what was some symbolic and what wasn't. Just look and see, did God specifically remove that? Well, then it served no, no, no real intrinsic purpose in benefiting you. If, if, if it's God, then the only reason was that it was a shadow of things to come. And of what? It says in that verse in Colossians 2, but the body is of Christ. It was supposed to be symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm going to start off here. I want you to go to, let's begin here. Go to Leviticus chapter number 8, verse number 30. Let's go to the institution of the priesthood, of the priest and of the high priest. And what, how does it all begin? How does it all start? Well, they must be anointed. They must be appointed to this business, correct? Knowing that it is meant to be the Old Testament priesthood, it was only instituted for the sole purpose of 
being a shadow of things to come, we should be able to find symbolism all throughout the priesthood that points us to Christ, shouldn't we? Well, let's look at the Bible here. Let's look here first in Leviticus chapter number 8. This here is, uh, it speaks of uh, the anointing of the priests of the Old Testament. And it talks about how they were anointed. And they were meant to be anointed with oil. The Bible talks about that in the Old Testament the same way the kings were anointed. That's why Jesus is, and also the prophets. And what is Jesus? Prophet, priest, and king. He fills all of those roles. So they were meant to be anointed, or they were supposed to be anointed with oil. All of the priests were meant to be anointed with oil. I want you to look here in, in Leviticus chapter number 8, verse number 30. I'm going to have you turn quite a bit. It might be a shorter sermon, but you're going to be turning to all the passages. I'm not going to read anything that you don't turn to. So I'd like you to see all of them. Look at Leviticus 8, chapter 8. As I said, verse 30, it says this. And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar, and then it says this, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his son's garments with him. And sanctified, that means set apart, and sanctified Aaron and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter number 133. So we see there that that was the anointing of the priest. Now, of the, all of the priests, there was actually one particular line. Of all of the sons of Levi which were the priests, they did, they ministered at the tabernacle, they did all the work of the tabernacle, you know, they, some had to set out the showbread, some were singers, you know, some were there to clean up, some were there to burn incense, right? Uh, you know, there were all different types of things, that some had to burn the oil, set the oil up for the burning of the candlestick, there was numerous, some, and then some were, like of the line of Aaron, the high priest. There's only one high priest that was ordained or appointed, and he alone was the one that brought in the sacrifice. Now, we saw there that all the priests were anointed. All the priests were anointed with oil was the way that they were anointed. We're going to see this again here in, in the book of Psalms. I want you to look at Psalm, as I said, chapter number 133. And we'll see this mentioned again. Verse number 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious... Precious ointment, that's referring to the oil, ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts, that's the bottoms, right, of his garments. So notice, how was Aaron the high priest? How was he anointed? He was anointed with oil. Well, in the Old Testament, oftentimes the Bible would talk about people being anointed with oil. Many times, synonymously or concurrently, when they would anoint that person with oil, what would come upon them? The Holy Spirit. What's the anointing of in the, in the New Testament? What is the anointing that the Bible talks about in the New Testament? It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? I want you to turn to, uh, with me to 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 27, just to see an example of this. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 27. I'll show you an example of this. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 27. The Bible says this, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. What abides in you? The Holy Spirit, right? So that anointing is what? It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, Ye shall abide in him. So what was the anointing there? It was the Holy Spirit. Just like the Old Testament priests were meant to be anointed by oil, that was a representation of the Holy Spirit. Now the candlesticks even. The candlestick, what does the candlestick represent? I preached a sermon about this, remember? It represented all of the different gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? It represents the oil that pumps through it represented the Holy Spirit in the candlestick. That's what oil in the Bible many times represents if you do a Bible study of that. Over and over and over again. So we see Aaron, the high priest, being anointed with what? With oil in order for him to begin his ministry. Before they ever begin their ministry as a priest, what has to happen? They have to be anointed. Well, the same exact thing happened with Jesus before he began his ministry as our high priest. I want you to turn to uh, Luke chapter number 4, verse number 18. We're going to go to two passages and see this. Luke Chapter number 4, verse number 18. Luke chapter number 4, verse number 18. This is Jesus telling you that his anointing was by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 18, he quotes a scripture that, that is actually prophetic of himself. And he says this, 
Look at verse 17 as well. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What was he anointed by? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me. Notice that. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Let's look at when he was anointed. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter number 3. Before the priests were allowed to begin their ministry, they had to be ordained by the anointing of the oil. Well, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was right when he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Look at Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 16. It says this, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. From this point forward, Jesus began his ministry. At this moment, as soon as he was anointed, that was what sent him forth into his ministry. Go to Hebrews chapter number 5. We'll see this spoken of again, his anointing. Hebrews chapter number 5. We're going to look at verse number 5. Hebrews chapter number 5. It says this in verse number 5. So also Christ glorified not, glorified not himself. Let's back up a little bit actually. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> verse 4. We'll start in verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So he's talking about how Aaron was called of God, the line of Aaron, and then what happened? God actually had him anointed. He chose him out and said, hey, this is the proof I'm going to have you anointed. He also had Aaron's uh, rod that budded, didn't he? This was meant to set him apart to be a proof, right? Remember when John the Baptist came? What did God tell John the Baptist? Hey, whoever you see that the Spirit descending on, that's him. That, that was the proof, just like Aaron's rod budding. Further, look at verse 4. Again, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Verse 5. So also Christ glorified, glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Look at verse 6. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 10 again. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we notice both were called of God, Aaron and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? God gave a miraculous proof for both, didn't he? He also had said that they must be anointed first, and he did so himself. He anointed with oil in the Old Testament, which was symbolic of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit anointing him. Not only that, this is even more interesting. I want you to turn to, go with me to um, Numbers chapter number 4. Go to Numbers chapter number 4. The book of Numbers chapter number 4. There was a specific age when the priests were to begin their ministry. There was a specific age, not only for the priests, but for the high priest to begin his ministry. Go to Numbers chapter number 4. Some of those of, of uh, Levi could begin the ministry at 25 years old. But I want you to look here in Numbers chapter number 4, and it speaks of those that are of, of Aaron's line, and those that were going to deal more with the tabernacle. And this would apply to the high priest. Look at uh, Numbers 4, look at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the son of the son of Kohath, sons of Kohath, from among the sons of Levi, after their families, by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upward, even until fifty years old. All that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. Notice the most holy thing. That's referring to the holiest of all. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about all those that would be ordained as the high priest. Do you know what age they were when they began? 30 years old. I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 3. Luke chapter number 3. So what happened then? That means they were anointed at a certain time, weren't they? They were anointed by oil. What happened with Jesus? He was anointed at a certain time. He was anointed by oil, the Holy Spirit. Look at Luke chapter number 3. Look at verse number 21. It says this. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized. This is what we just read about. What moment is this? This is where he's going to begin his ministry, isn't it? Look at what it says. Also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and, and the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape 
like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. That sound familiar? Like very similar to what was quoted even in Hebrews too as well. But not only that, we see that this is when he was ordained for his ministry. Let's see how old he is. Look at verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. You think that's a coincidence? Not a chance. The only reason why the priesthood was instituted in the first place was to be a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the priest to come. Amen. I want you to go to Malachi chapter number 2, verse number 4. Malachi chapter number 2, verse number 4. The priests of the Old Testament were a mediator of the, of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament, of the law. I want you to look at Malachi chapter number 2. Malachi Chapter number 2, look at verse number 4. It tells you this. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 5. Notice how he's saying that the covenant is with Levi. That's because they are the ones that bear the covenant. They are responsible for the Old Testament law. They teach it. They are the mediator between God and men for that covenant in a sense. Correct? Look at verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he made, wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. So the priests were meant to be the priests of what? The Old Testament priests were the priests of the Old Covenant, weren't they? Of the Old Testament. Well, that only represented the Lord Jesus Christ being the priest or the mediator of the New Testament. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 24. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 24. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 24, it talks about this. It says this. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So notice it talks about Jesus being the mediator of the new covenant, saying he's the mediator of the New Testament. That's because the Old Testament priests, they were in a sense a mediator, but they were a sense of they were in the sense of the mediator of the of the old covenant. Obviously, just being a picture st uh, still of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. I want you to go to just a couple other small things we'll look at here. Go to Exodus chapter number 29, verse number 6. Exodus chapter number 29, verse number 6. Exodus chapter number 29, verse number 6. It says in Exodus chapter number 29, verse number 6. I'm not going to go over verse number 5 and 6, but verse number 5 and 6, uh, uh, each item in the list, that is. Verse number 5 and 6 go over um, the, uh, the priest's attire from head to toe. And the description is extremely similar to what Jesus looks like in Revelation chapter number 1. Not only that, it's extremely similar. We're going to look at this to Jesus, of course, because he looks almost the same in Revelation chapter number 19. But I want to point out one thing that's interesting. Number five, uh, in verse number 5, it talks about his breastplate. It talks about you know his coat and his robe and all of those things. But then in verse number 6, it says this, And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and then it says, And put the holy crown upon the mitre. So he's wearing a crown and he has a breastplate, right? I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 19. We'll see the mention of the crown. We'll look at this one quickly. Revelation chapter number 19. So you think he just has on the crown all oh, it's just because of this reason. No, kings wear crowns. Kings wear crowns. Jesus was a king and a priest. And the reason why the priests wore the crown in the Old Testament was to be figurative of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the king and the priest. Look at Revelation chapter number 19. It says in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, then it says, and on his head were many crowns. I want you to turn in your Bible. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. Let's go to verse number 9. I'm going to touch on this quickly because it's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're talking about right now, but it's related to what we're getting ready to get into. So Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 9, it says this, which was a figure for the time then present, 
in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices <clears throat> that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come a high priest of good things by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Verse 12, pay attention. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, purge your conscience from dead works? To serve the living God. We of course know that the Lord Jesus Christ. That the sacrifices even of the Old Testament. Were representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. As our sacrifice. Right? I want you to go to. Let's look at a couple verses about this. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Notice there in Hebrews 9. It said that he offered himself without spot. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1, it talks about this again, verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 10. Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 10. Notice that it said that Jesus was... As a lamb without spot. The Old Testament sacrifices were just representative of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. The ultimate sacrifice. They did nothing for their sins. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats can take away sins. That's not possible. They were only meant to represent Jesus who would one day come and would be that ultimate sacrifice... When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Yeah. So he knew this is the real Lamb of God. That's why in the Old Testament, when the sacrifices were brought, they were to be without blemish. They were to also be a male. They were also, when they brought it from the Passover, you know what else it was supposed to be? It was the first fruits. It was supposed to be the firstborn of the flock. What was Jesus? The firstborn. What was he? The Son of God. He was a male, right? He was without blemish. Why, was he, why did it have to be without blemish? Because the Bible says that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That you know, a lamb having no physical blemish was meant to represent Jesus having no spiritual blemish, him being perfect and without spot and without sin. Look here in Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 10. It says this. And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. You know what that represents? Is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want you to turn now with me to go to Leviticus chapter number 21. Because not only did the lamb have to be without blemish, but the priest had to be without blemish. Those that were of Aaron, those that were qualified because they were of the right line, they were of the right lineage, even within being of the tribe of Levi, they also had to be specifically the sons of Aaron. But that alone did not qualify them. There was another factor. They themselves had to be without blemish. I want you to look at Leviticus chapter number 21, verse number 16. It says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous. All of you guys are eliminated. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Verse 19, or a man that is broken footed or broken hand, handed, or a crooked back, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scab, or have his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. You know why? You know why the lamb and the priest both had to be without blemish? 
Because Jesus was the sacrifice and the sacrificer. The, the, the lamb represented Jesus being sinless, but guess what? Jesus was the one sacrificing himself as well. That's why the priest representing Jesus also had to be without blemish. Because it was symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ as our high priest being without sin. Being without any iniquity in his life. I want you now to go to uh, Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 24. The Bible says uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Go to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. Book of Hebrews chapter number 9. And verse number 24 says this. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. So I want you to notice there what, the, what was the representation of the Old Testament when he says that he didn't enter into the holy places made with hands. It says, but into heaven itself. Keep reading there. I'm going to elaborate more in a moment on that. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by, watch this, the sacrifice of himself. Notice, the high priest used to go in. What would they do? One time a year for the sins of all the people. The Bible says they had to bring in two sacrifices, number one. The, the, the high priest had to go into the holiest of all, and no one else was allowed to go in here. None of the other children of Levi, only the high priest, the one that was of the line of Aaron that was appointed to go next. He was allowed to go into the holiest of all. It's also known as the Holy of Holies. And he would bring in a sacrifice. Now, within this, there's a veil. If there's a, like a curtain that covers this area. You know, In there is the mercy seat. You have the Ark of the Covenant, and within the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod that budded. There was the, the pot full of manna, and then there was the, the stones, the Ten Commandments were in, and were in this. Now, he was to bring this in there, and he was to offer this upon an altar that was in there. The high priest, alone, no one else. And if anybody else went in, God said that he was going to kill them. He was going to, you know, to, to put them to death you know, supernaturally. They were not allowed to go in in this area. They were not allowed to walk in here. Now, this high priest had to come in and bring in two sacrifices, I said. Number one, because he was a sinner himself, the high priest, he had to go in and sacrifice for himself first. Just so that his sacrifice would be acceptable when he went to sacrifice the sacrifice for the sins of the people, right? This was just representative, of course. We know that. He went in. Well, think about this. That high priest had to go in and take two sacrifices. Jesus walked in just himself. He didn't bring anything with him. Jesus went in there. He didn't have to carry a sacrifice for the other people, a literal lamb, and he also didn't have, or for himself, I'm sorry, and he also didn't have to bring a literal lamb for the sins of the people. He was the lamb. He was the high priest. He was the sacrifice and the sacrificer. He was the high priest and he was the lamb of God that went in there. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind, the, the, the significance of that veil, and that no one else was allowed to go in there but that one high priest. I want you to turn in your Bibles now, please, to uh, go to, uh, we're in the same chapter, go to verse number 6. This is mentioned again where it speaks further about the veil, about the, the holiest of all. It says this in verse number 6. It says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God, Saying all of the other priests, not, not the high priest, but they would go in and into the, into the, it says, the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. Look at verse 7. But into the second, that's within the veil, but into the second went the high priest alone, once every year. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So notice it wasn't made manifest, meaning it wasn't made known. It wasn't quite understood. Now, we're told that the holiest of all represented what just a moment ago? What did it represent? Heaven. It represented the presence of God, which makes perfect sense because what was located within the veil? 
What was in there, in the veil? Anybody? The mercy seat. That's the throne of God. That's actually referred to as, you know, God's throne. It talks about us, us, and we'll look at this verse, actually, we're going to end on this verse in just a moment. It talks about us going to his throne to find mercy, to find grace, right? That's why it's called the mercy seat. We would approach his throne and receive grace or mercy from him by praying to him. But it represented the presence of God. What is around, what does the Bible teach is around the throne of God? Cherubim, right? What's around, what do they have on the mercy seat? Cherubim. That represented the throne of God, the presence of God, where? In heaven. That's what it told you there in Hebrews 9. I'll read it to you one more time. So it says in verse 24, For Christ, in, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. So notice the true is heaven itself, isn't it? God's presence right there before him, and it was represented in the Old Testament by what? The mercy seat. That was the purpose of it. Now, notice that he's entering into God's presence for what? For us. You go back there, Hebrews chapter number 9, it tells you in verse number 8 that the Holy Ghost, now that's talking about the scriptures, because the Holy Ghost obviously is what had those things written down. It's interesting. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. You know what that means? You now, it wasn't completely made known how we were reconciled to God, was it? Now, here's the thing. You know, the Bible talks about how the prophets sought diligently to understand the salvation that came unto us, didn't it? When they knew that the Christ or the Messiah was coming, they knew that God was sending a Savior, but did they understand every detail? That's something the Bible is very clear about. It wasn't manifest. It even uses that word, I believe, in uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1, or maybe 1 Peter chapter number 1, talking about that exactly. That everything was not made manifest yet, right? Well, that's what this is referring to. How are we going to get in, into the presence of God? How are we going to be able to stand before God? What is going to bridge that gap between God and man? How does the Bible begin? Man sins, right? And then at that point, there's a rift or there is a gap that is between God and man, isn't there? So what do we need? We need a mediator. We need to be able to get into that presence of God. We need to be able to get back with God. What is separating us? There's this veil now there. There's this veil that's hanging there that stops us from getting to God. You understand what I'm saying right now? Does it make sense? Well, verse 9, we'll read further. It says, which was a figure for the time then present. So notice that this was just a picture for the time then present, and it was meant to symbolize how... The way was not yet made manifest. But then it says this at the very end of verse 8. That the way was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. That's referring to the fact of before Jesus came. Now I want you to turn to uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 19. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 19. The Bible says this. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness... To enter into the holiness. Now what is that? That's within the veil, isn't it? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us. And then it says this. Through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. Now, I want you to notice that the veil there is symbolized by his flesh. By the flesh of Jesus. Who is what? It's God. That veil represents the gap between God and man. Now, the only way for God to bring man back to himself is for him to fill that gap. Amen. You know what he had to do? He had to step into human flesh. Amen. He had to become a man Amen. himself in order to bring man back to himself. There's only one way to do so. There's no one else qualified. We have to have, you know, you know what you need? I mean, it's, it's this simple. A child can figure this out. You have God here. You have man here. You know what you need? A God-man. It's that simple. That's the only person that can fill the gap. Man is not good enough. Man is not righteous. You know what we need? Someone that's righteous. Amen. You, know the only, you know the only qualifier? God. You know what God has to do? God has to become man. Now, I want you to think about this. So that veil represents what? It represents his flesh. 
You know what he's doing is he's the one standing there in that gap to reconcile man back unto himself. Go to uh, Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 45. Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 45. You may or may not have noticed this ever. It, it, it's somewhat, it seems some, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, insignificant, I guess you could say, while reading. It's not emphasized very much. But look, in, look at something that happened here I want to point out to you when Jesus died. Matthew chapter number 27, look at verse number 45. It says this. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 47. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now watch verse 51. And behold, so what just happened? He died. Verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. You know what just happened? Man was able to go into that holiest of all at that point. Man then, the relationship between God and man was then reconciled. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but what that represented with that, that, that uh, the, the veil being rent in the temple was God. God dying on the cross as a man and him as the mediator bringing mankind back unto himself. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 16. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 16. Hebrews chapter number 2. I'm sorry, actually. Yeah, we'll go to Hebrews 2 and then we'll go to Hebrews 4. Let's go to Hebrews 2, 16. First, because this is also in relation to his flesh, him becoming a man, how this was needful, it was necessary. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 16. We'll read this quickly. Not spend a lot of time here, and I want to end in Hebrews 4. It says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be, notice he had to be made unto his brethren for this reason, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make re reconciliation for the sins of the people. I want to end in Hebrews chapter number 4. Probably just a page over for you. I want you to look there in verse number 14. It says this, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the, heaven, into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Then it says this, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly, Unto the throne of grace. That's why it's called the mercy seat. That's why the mercy seat was inside that veil. That's what it represented. It's like saying the grace seat. Grace and mercy are interchangeable. It's the mercy seat. And why are we able to come in there? Because through his flesh, the veil that was consecrated in a new and living way, wasn't it? That's what that veil actually represented all along, was the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. It represented, this is the point, the humanity of God. The humanity that God would one day take on, the flesh that he would one day take on, for the purpose of bringing mankind back to himself. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, taking on that flesh. We thank you for... Uh,